Hey everybody, welcome to week six of PS398. So in the previous lecture, we talked about bargaining and how it relates to a normative criterion called Pareto optimality. And we saw that there's a lot of promise in terms of thinking about international processes from this bargaining perspective. The basic idea is that um, at any moment in time, you might have two or more states engaged in an interaction where both or all states would stand to benefit if something positive would happen, if they would all come to some deal, something good would happen. And if they failed to achieve that, that good outcome, then they would wind up at some Pareto inferior disagreement point, which is bad. It's wasteful. But the problem is, in bargaining situations, even though everybody has an incentive to make a deal, everybody wants to make a deal because disagreement is costly, because there are um, countervailing incentives at work, because what makes me better off makes you worse off and vice versa, it's difficult or potentially even sometimes impossible for us to achieve some bargain solution. And at the end of the last lecture, I talked a little bit about the relationship between conflict and exchange, the two primary mechanisms of transfer. The way that we transfer resources with one another is sort of so foundational it's hard to think about, but when you see them clearly delineated in the, the way of conflict and the way of exchange, it's easy to see that there's something qualitatively different about different modes of transfer, even though they might look very similar prima facie. They're, they're, they have different DNA, they are different species, even though they perform the same function. Now, in international relations, we typically just focus on bargaining, and we're going to continue to do that throughout the class, and we'll also focus on game theoretic analysis, non-cooperative game theoretic analysis, where a lot of the time is spent, even if it isn't in a formal bargaining problem, there will be a bargaining flavor to things. There will be a conflicty flavor to things. And so consequently, you might come out of a class like this thinking that this was a class about nasty, bargainy, conflicty sort of things. And a lot of international relations has that flavor because international relations transpires under international anarchy. However, it appears to me, at least, that you won't be able to get everything you can out of this bargainy, game theory-ish, uh, conflictual sort of setup. You won't really be able to see that vista fully unless you're able to think about how conflict looks relative to exchange. And that's why I'd like to spend a week on sort of textbook canonical exchange, um, which should give you some sense about the real differences between these two species of transfer, the conflict route and the exchange route. So today I want to talk about markets. Markets are not something that get discussed all that often in political science. Uh, that is very much the purview of economic theory. Oftentimes we see markets that emerge for sort of clandestine reasons that we think are interesting. Um, but I want to talk about good old-fashioned cloth and wine neoclassical markets today. I think it'll be a lot of fun for us to, to just sort of spend a week on things that are, are, are positive. Another reason to study markets, at least for a week, is because so much of what we do in formal political science game theoretic or otherwise mathematically theoretical political science, so much of that falls under the domain of political economy, which is a term that is so completely vague that it's hard to use anymore. Um, but so much of it is about the marriage of politics and economics. And a lot of international relations is about the marriage of politics and economics, to the point where if I, if I say to you international political economy, it's difficult to tell if I mean the use of economic methods to study the political problems of international relations, or political study of the economic processes of international relations. Do I mean the economics of the politics or the politics of the economics? Oh, geez, that's enough to make your head explode to begin the class, huh? It's hard to get these things right. It's hard to disentangle conflict and exchange. It's hard to make all of these things work under one set of physics. So today's lecture will be It'll, it'll feel pretty brisk, it'll feel like we're moving pretty fast, and that's because we will be sort of jumping around an introductory micro-textbook, basically, trying to get just everything you need and nothing you don't en route to talking about what trade looks like in the simplest possible sense. How do two states use a pricing mechanism to exchange two different commodities with, with one another, and what are the ramifications of that process? That's all that I want to talk about today. Two states, two commodities, perfect competition, classic theory, and what happens. There's some important ramifications within international relations as well. So, so depending on where trends are at the moment, we're oftentimes concerned with the relationship between international trade and international conflict. 
you know, so, so many people are of the opinion that trade causes peace, which is a difficult thing to think through um, for reasons that I'm happy to get into any time. It's really difficult. Uh, I, if you got me started on that, it would probably take me about six hours to be done or six years. Who knows? But when we think about this, that this re- when we think about the relationship between trade and conflict or trade and other sort of nastier aspects of international relations, it's important that we do so with a good grounding in what it is that we mean by trade when we see when we say trade. Now, today's lecture is going to be very stylized and very simple and straightforward. And we'll see about that. And so it's not going to be a perfect fable in terms of international trade. However, it's a useful baseline. What I'll be showing you today, while not a very realistic model of international exchange, is a very useful baseline to compare reality against. One great thing about a fable is it gives you something to compare reality against. And sometimes you'll say to yourself, well, this this fable seems off. And then when you dig into why the fable doesn't do a great job of pinning down a particular process, you learn from trying to break that. You know, it, it's a lot of fun to like start from somewhere beautiful and then say, how do I ruin it? Just as much as it is to start from somewhere simple and then like Arrow's theorem, come up with a very ruinous punchline. This is stuff that I find very interesting. I discovered this late in my in my graduate training. I had never taken an econ class or anything, and I, I still haven't really taken one. And so, you know, this is stuff that's that I love quite a bit um, for for odd autodidactic reasons. Some of this was was stuff that really piqued my interest when I was at a formative time in, in my in my in graduate school. And so, you know, I get excited about this um, maybe more than most international relations people would. But I think this is super cool, and I think it's a, it's very much a, a baseline to compare other theories against. I think that the neoclassical model of exchange um, is about as clean as it gets in terms of, of, of theoretical modeling in the social sciences, and it's a good thing to try to aspire to. So I'm really looking forward to showing some of this stuff to you today. So in the A block, I want to talk about the consumer's problem. The consumer's problem is, is relatively simple and straightforward. The basic idea is this. Suppose that you have some amount of resources that determine how wealthy you are. You have some amount of wealth based on your resources. And you observe the prices that are out there in the world. You, you go to Amazon and you see how much everything is. And you know how, much, how many resources you have. And you know how much everything costs. The question then is, what is your favorite bundle of goods that you could buy given the prices and given your wealth level? So you, you, you figure out how wealthy you are and you figure out how expensive everything is. And conditional on those two things, you figure out where you would like to spend your resources. You might not spend a whole lot of money on something that's too expensive, even though you really like it. And you might spend a lot of money on something that you don't like that much if it's inexpensive enough for you to buy lots of it. The punchline of the consumer's problem is to derive what we're going to call demand functions that read in prevailing market prices and resource levels and spit out the desired goods that, that every state would like to have. So this is going to blend together a lot of different things. It's going to blend together resources, prices, preferences. We're going to see a lot of things come together in a relatively simple geometric setup. You'll be able to see a lot of things on the screen. But I think that you'll see that there's a lot of nuance just in this single purchasing decision, which is laughably far from how people actually make their purchases. But if you're anything like I am anyway, you'll be fascinated even though it isn't very realistic. In the B block, I want to switch from a single consumer to two states that are engaged in some sort of potential trade with one another. We'll go back to the Edgeworth box. We'll try to figure out what trade and prices look like in the context of the Edgeworth box. If I have some resources and you have some resources, that determines where our initial endowment of resources is is in this Edgeworth box. We, We learn the dimensions of the Edgeworth box, the resources, all of this is just given to us. There's an Edgeworth box, and we got to figure out where we want to trade to within it. we got to figure out how do we get from the status quo, the economic status quo, where I have lots of stuff, some of which I like and some of which I don't, and you have lots of stuff, some of which you like and some of which you don't. we got to figure out how we're going to trade with one another, how we're going to turn Coca-Cola into rooibos tea for one another, depending on how much stuff we have, what our preferences are, and what the prevailing market prices are. And then in the C block, we'll talk about how it all comes together in some kind of equilibrium. We'll talk about the nature of Valrasian equilibrium. Bluntly speaking, a Valrasian equilibrium is just a price. It's a price that clears the markets. It's the price at which I want to buy stuff from you and you want to buy stuff from me and the amount that we want to buy and sell from one another all equals out. It's the place where we have supply is made equal to demand. It's the place where all of the zeros have happened. All, there's a giant system of equations that is international relations. 
and it's the solution to the giant economic system of equations of international markets all across the world. We'll talk about whether or not it exists, and we'll talk about some of its normative ramifications in the context of Pareto optimality. So this is really part two of a two-part lecture on conflict, exchange, optimality, bargaining, and markets. Oh my goodness gracious, you are getting your money's worth from every angle right now. And you're like, actually, no, that isn't true. Your point's well taken. But I think that you'll see some really cool things happening. This allows you to answer provocative questions like, why are diamonds more expensive than water, even though you don't need diamonds to live? And you're like, actually, I need diamonds to live. This allows you to answer provocative questions like, who is wealthy and who is not? Who has much and who does not? Which states fare well in the international economy and which do not? In the absence of centralized planning, if we don't have a state to keep track of international markets, are we able to arrive at some equilibrium? And if so, by what processes? And what are the outcomes of that? Oh my goodness gracious, it's all coming together in this very beautiful rectangle. And you'll see that inside the rectangle lives two triangles. And these, this rectangle with two triangles answers a whole lot of questions about how things go together in international relations. So I really can't wait to show this to you. Let's get started. So here in the A block, I just want to get a sense about what the consumer's problem looks like. What is it to try to figure out what you would like to buy, given how much money you have, and given how expensive everything is? And all of this, all of today's lecture is going to be just simple examples. Uh, I, I don't want to get too deep into this because this is, we're not going to be hitting trade too much more. I just want to get, I just want you to see what it looks like. So I just want to start with a simple example. Suppose that there are two commodities in the world, and let's just call them cloth and wine. All right, so there's two commodities in the world. There is cloth and there is wine. And you are interested in figuring out how much cloth and wine you would like to purchase. What is your perfect amount of cloth and wine given your resources? But there's two dimensions, two dimensions, cloth, wine. Suppose that you have, going into the world, you wake up one day and you observe that you control some amount of cloth and some amount of wine. You have some cloth and wine to begin with. You're gonna go into the interaction with some amount of cloth and wine. Okay? That's going to be called your initial endowment. You'll have an initial endowment of cloth and wine. And just to keep things not so opaque, suppose that you go into the world with five bolts of cloth and five barrels of wine. You, these are just the units. Bolts of cloth, barrels of wine. I think bolt is the right unit for cloth. Yeah, bolt is the right unit. Look at me go. I know things. I only learned that from a video game. I'm going to date myself. I learned that from the video game Ogre Battle 64. Ogre Battle 64, which is a highly underrated RPG. So you go into the world, you have five bolts of cloth and five barrels of wine. And maybe you like cloth a lot and wine not very much. Maybe you like wine a lot and cloth not very much, or maybe you like them about the same. But you come into this world and, and the, the, what you happen to have, this five and five, that may or may not suit your preferences, all right? That may or may not suit your preferences. So what I want to do is I want to be able to compare different amounts of cloth and wine. So let's go to a two-dimensional space. Zoom! And we'll suppose that along this axis, we show how many bolts of cloth you have. And along this axis, we show how many barrels of wine you have. Does wine come in barrels? Now I got to figure that out. Yeah, it comes in barrels. That I did not learn from a video game. So you've got bolts of cloth and barrels of wine. And notice that I can just plot your initial endowment of five bolts of cloth and five barrels of wine right here. There it is. Boom! It's just a dot. So let's talk about preferences. Now, the basic idea for a lot of this is going to be that more is preferred to less. Okay, so, so in general, from this dot, you would get happier if I gave you a little bit more wine. You would get happier if I gave you a little bit more cloth. Or you would get happier if I gave you a little bit of both. So you get strictly happier as I go due north, as I go due east, or as I go northeast. This is just like before. This is just like the beginning of the Edgeworth box from last week. You could go back to that if you wanted to, but that's a huge if. So here's my, here's my bundle in this space. Here's my initial endowment in this space. And I could just draw a level set through it. I can just draw a level set right through it. Right? This is the set of all bundles where I'm indifferent between 5-5 five, five and that bundle. So let me just choose an arbitrary bundle along the curve. And what I want to say to you is 5-5 five, five is indifferent to that bundle. 
for any bundle that lives on this curve. Some of them have more cloth and less wine. Some of them have more wine and less cloth. And so we get this curvy, and the idea is that you want to go this way and inside the cup, just like before. You want to go to the northeast and inside the cup. Notice something with me. Suppose that you liked cloth a lot and wine not very much. You're a teetotaling fashionista. Band name of the century, teetotaling fashionista. So you're a teetotaling fashionista. So that means you like cloth a lot and wine not so much. So if that's the case, then your level set is going to be shaped this way. Now suppose instead that you liked wine a lot and cloth not very much. You're a naked drunkard. Not as good of a band name. But you're a naked drunkard. You don't care about cloth, but you, you need wine a lot. Everybody has that friend in undergrad. And if that's the case, then your level set will be shaped more, a little bit more like this. And if you like them equally, then it'll be shaped like this. The basic idea is we can figure out if you like cloth a lot, wine a lot, or balanced based on the shape of these level sets and which way they tilt. So right now we have an initial endowment and we have a level set that goes through that endowment. Now let me tell you the fable of the consumer's problem. Right now we haven't had a fable just yet, but this is the fable. Let me tell you what the fable is. Once upon a time you woke up and you noticed that you had five bolts of cloth and five barrels of wine. You're like, this isn't a very exciting fable, shut up. And then you notice, you go out, you, you open up, you, you go to some financial website. You go to some financial website and you go to the commodities markets. You go to the commodities markets, you, you open up the Wall Street Journal and you say, I'm going to read the commodities prices. Apparently you have to say this to yourself before you do this. You're like, I'm going to figure out what all the prices of the commodities are today. And suppose that you learned that one bolt of cloth was worth $1. And suppose that you learned that one barrel of wine was worth $1. They're both worth a dollar. So here's the idea. There's a price for all these goods. Every good has a price. And the idea is you wake up with your endowment, you sell your whole endowment. You say, you know what? I don't like this endowment. I'm going to cash in my chips. Maybe you want more wine and less cloth. Maybe you want more cloth and less wine. You cash in your chips. You sell your five bolts of cloth. You sell your five barrels of wine. You sell them at prevailing market prices, which you just learned on the Wall Street Journal at the commodities market section. So you sell that. What are you now worth? How much money is in your pocket? You had five bolts of cloth and you sold them at $1 per bolt of cloth. So the cloth got you $5. And you had five barrels of wine, each of which was worth a dollar. So you sell that, that got you $5. So you, get, you had $5 worth of cloth and $5 worth of wine. You have $10. Congratulations, you now have $10 and you have nothing in your pocket. You have, you have no commodities and $10. Okay. You have no commod. you have sold your bundle. You have sold your endowment. You sold your endowment at prevailing market prices. Now somebody else has it. But well, you have money now. Congratulations. Now you have currency. You have money in your pocket. Now, which, which combinations of cloth and wine, which bundles in this bundle space, which, which bundles could you afford now? Which ones can you afford? Which bundles can you afford with $10? We know you could uh, afford 5.5. Five. That's where you started. What if you spent all of your money on cloth? What if you spent all your money on cloth and none of your money on wine? Which is to say, what's the x-intercept? Of this if you had ten dollars and you could buy cloth at a buck per bolt you could buy ten you could buy ten bolts of cloth if you wanted to you could have zero barrels of wine and ten bolts of cloth you could be at ten zero you could be a five five you could be a ten zero okay similarly if you put all ten dollars into wine and wine was selling for a buck a barrel then you could buy ten barrels of wine for ten dollars boy that would be nice wouldn't it so you could buy 10 barrels of wine. So whenever you have to do something like this for a problem set or something, what you do is get these two intercepts down. You know, get, figure out how much you could buy, how much you could buy if you spent all of your money on one commodity. And then it's just a line in between. Them. Oh geez, it's a triangle again. So this is, your, this is the set of affordable bundles. This is the set of all bundles, no more expensive than your initial endowment given the prices. This is your budget set, we call this. These are the things you can afford. You could afford 0, 0. You could afford 0, 10. You could afford 10, 0, 5, 5, or anywhere in between. You could afford anywhere in this triangle. These are all the bundles that you're allowed to buy. You can't go into debt. And I'm not going to allow you to have negative bundles. So there's a triangle. You can't go into debt. 
You can't, like, save for the future right now. All you can do is buy back some amount of cloth and wine. And the question is, which bundle would you buy if you could? Which bundle would you buy? And the answer is, it depends on your preferences. So suppose that we were at 5.5, which we know lives right along this affordability frontier. Oh, geez, there's frontiers everywhere. Even in your mind, my friend. So, so you're somewhere along this frontier. And f let's say we're at 5.5. Let me draw the level set through that. Let me draw the level set through 5.5. Five. Now notice something with me. Let's zoom in. Notice something with me. Here's an interesting question. Are there any bundles that I could afford that I prefer to my initial endowment of 5.5? Five? Are there any bundles that I can afford? Anything inside my affordability triangle? Anything inside my budget set that I prefer? And if so, how would I know? Well, notice that because the line, you just follow that budget line, right? So there are elements of the budget line that are inside the cup. Those are things that cost $10. Everything along the line costs $10. And, but these things are, in, they cost $10, which is how much money I have. And they're better than 5.5. Five. They're better than 5.5. Five. So in other words, if I have this sort of intersection, just like last week, if there's this intersection, if there's a little bit of, of budget line that goes through the cup, then 5.5, five, that can't be my favorite bundle that's affordable. Because look, right here, there's a whole bunch of bundles that cost $10 and that I strictly prefer to 5.5. Five. So in other words, I'm not going to buy back my original bundle unless I just happen to like cloth and wine equally. What would that look like? Well, that would mean, just like before, here it comes, that would mean that the, that the level set just kissed the, the frontier of affordability. It would just go, it just kisses it. So when that happens, now look, anything that's strictly better than 5.5 than five five is more expensive than 5.5. Five. Right? So that's what we're looking for here. We're looking for situations where the only thing that's better than what you bought is more expensive than the money that you had. We're looking for bundles that are the best among your affordable bundles. That's pretty cool, right? This is already getting pretty cool. If I'm a country, I'm trying to figure out whether a country is going to import a good or export a good. And we know how much stuff they have to begin with. Well, if they have more than what they would like to buy, then they're going to have, they're going to get less of it. They're going to export that in very broad, simple brushstrokes. This is just to kind of get your orientation. And if they don't, if their if their initial endowment of a particular commodity is smaller than what they would buy, then they got to import it. The idea of perfect competition, the assumption of perfect competition is simply that you can buy or sell as much of any good as you would like to at the prevailing market prices. So the prices are out there. You observe the prices and you make your choices. It's an implausible assumption a lot of time in international relations where you might be big enough that you don't have to take the prices as given. Maybe your purchases influence the prices. But right now we're assuming that away. We're saying there's a commodity that I would like more of, but I also can buy as much of it as I would like at the prevailing market prices without meaningfully changing the prices. So let's go back to our original version where 5.5 wasn't optimal. However, we'll be able to notice that there's somewhere Somewhere along that sort of everything that costs $10, but it's strictly better, somewhere in that area is a point where a kiss will happen. There's a point where, the, where just that kissing happens, and that winds up being the demanded bundle. That ends up being the amount of cloth and wine that you, a state, would rather have that is affordable, conditional on your initial endowment, but which is better for you relative to your preferences than the other affordable bundles are, including your initial endowment. So you come into the world, you have an initial endowment of stuff. You see the prices of the stuff. You sell all your stuff. Then you say, what's the best thing that I could buy back with the money that I have in my pocket given those same prices? So the prices matter two times. They matter in terms of how wealthy you are. The prices determine how wealthy you are because that tells you what your stuff is worth. When you go to the pawn shop and sell your stuff, the prices of the relative things determine how much wealth you get out of that. And then 
the, the prices determine how much you want to buy of everything because it tells you how expensive everything is. So the prices matter twice. They determine your wealth and they determine what you'll want to buy in the end. Prices, prices, just prices, the price of things. And I, this is not in the abstract. I mean, literally the price of things, the price of oil, the price of gas, the price of steel, the price of iron, the price of labor, the price of things. I just want to show you how that mattered. Okay. So suppose that we were still at five, five. Suppose we began with the same once upon a time. Once upon a time, you wake up and you say, oh, look, I have five bolts of cloth and five barrels of wine. And that's how you talk to yourself in the morning, apparently. However, now suppose that every barrel of wine costs $2, not $1. Well, if that's the case, then let's think about what your initial endowment is worth, because now that's changed. Now you have five bolts of cloth, each of, worth is worth, each of which is worth a buck. So that's $5. And you've got five barrels of wine, each of, worth, each of which is worth $2. So now it's five plus 10. You have $15 in your pocket because the wine that you came into the world with is now more expensive. It's, it's, it gets you more at the pawn shop. So now you have $15. Let's think about what you could buy with that $15. So if you spent all $15 on cloth, you'd be able to go 15 units to the right. Right, so now you could you could buy the bundle, fifteen zero. You could have fifteen bolts of cloth and zero barrels of wine. Basically, at that point in time, what you did was you converted five barrels of wine into ten bolts of cloth. Right, that's what you did. You just traded with yourself. A lot of the introductory examples in this sort of theory are called Robinson Crusoe economies, where it's one person who is trading with themselves, trying to figure out. I don't know how much time to spend working versus how much time to spend resting. So Robinson Crusoe economies are actually kind of fun. It's a fun fable. That's, a, that's as fable as it gets. Imagine a person on a desert island saying, how do I act like homo economicus? So you just, so you could have, you could, you could turn five, five, if you wanted to into 15, zero. You could also turn it into zero, seven and a half. You could spend all $15 on wine. However, you wouldn't be able to buy, because wine costs $2 a barrel, that $15 would buy you seven and a half barrels. So notice now that we have shifted the triangle of affordability. We have changed the budget set. The prices change what you can afford. What things cost determine what you can afford and what, what you have is worth. The prices matter twice. They influence how wealthy you are. We went from $10 to $15 and they influence what you can buy. Now we've got this crooked triangle. So the, it's the same 5-5, five five, but the pricing environment completely changed everything. It changed what you were worth, and it also changed what you want to buy. So now consider your preferences. Let's draw that same level set through. And once again, unless it just so happens that 5-5 five five is the kiss point, unless that just so happens to be the case, you're gonna want to buy something other than your initial endowment. But wine is expensive. Right, so maybe your preferred bundle ends up being an intermediate amount of wine and not very much cloth at all because of how much we've flattened this triangle. Right, that's the trade-off that you are navigating right now. You are navigating the trade-off of expense. You are trying to figure out if one more sip of wine, given its price, makes you just as happy as one more, whatever the experience that we have with cloth is, one more day, day of fresh clothes. You have to figure that out. The whole point of this, the whole point of the consumer's problem is figuring out how consumers navigate the trade-offs that the pricing mechanism creates. Given their preferences and given how wealthy they are, conditional on that pricing mechanism. All sorts of things are happening together. Like it's all reinforcing itself more than you realize at first blush. So I want to think about this as a function. I want to think about something that reads in all of the relevant information for a decision problem and spits out the bundle that you want to buy. That's hard. That's really hard, right? Because it seems to me that the relevant exogenous information, the relevant data for my decision about how much to buy, the relevant data is twofold. It depends on my initial resources. It depends on where I am in this space. It depends on my endowment. It depends on how much cloth and wine I wake up with. But that isn't enough. I also have to know how expensive everything is, so I need the prices. So in other words, the relevant information for my decision is a set of two numbers, how much cloth I have and how much wine I have, and a set of two more numbers, how expensive is cloth and how expensive is wine. 
So I need four data points to know what to do in this theory, in this fable. I'm about to turn four data points into two data points, which is how much cloth I ultimately buy and how much wine I ultimately buy. And that's all a demand function is. A demand function is just a device that reads in initial resources, initial endowments, and the prices, and it spits out what you would buy. You are a walking demand function, right? You walk around and you have resources available to you. Usually you've already converted to currency. Most of us think about our resources in terms of currency. So you have some amount of money in your pocket, okay? You're a walking demand function. There's some amount of money in your pocket. And if you were at the world's greatest marketplace that had everything that, could, that was available for sale, you would buy something with that money, right? So you would convert your resources and the prices into a purchase. And that's all the consumer's problem is. This, the idea here is states have initial resources, but they might not be the perfect resources given the prices and given their preferences. How do we turn, how do we turn what we have into what we want? If I change the prices, I change the triangle. If I change the resources, I change the triangle. And then where my preferences happen to kiss that edge of the triangle, it's always going to be the edge of the triangle because I always want more. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend all my resources in this theory. That's called Walrus's Law. I'm going to wind, I'm not going to, I'm not going to buy some intermediate amount in this theory because I don't really care about tomorrow in this theory. In this theory, I just care about maximizing my cloth and wine happiness right now. So I'm not going to buy anything inside because I can always find something to the Northeast that's better. So I'm going to buy something along the frontier, but where I am on the frontier is going to depend on the prices, my preferences, my initial endowment. So all sorts of things are combining and you're like, yes, I've noticed. I'm very confused right now. Just stop. It's okay if you're confused. It's very okay if you're confused. I'm asking a lot of you right now. I'm asking you to keep track of many things. I'm asking you to keep track of how many resources are initially available. I'm asking you to keep track of the pricing environment. I'm asking you to keep track of the state's preferences over the commodities. All of this with two commodities. How many commodities are there in the world? Oh my goodness gracious. Just think about that for a second. How would we differentiate the commodities? Well, some of it is just there's different kinds of things, right? So right now I'm drinking oolong tea because I'm very fancy. Oh, that's good. Now think about all the different kinds of oolong tea. There's so many different kinds of oolong tea. There's probably, if I go to the tea website that I shop from, there's probably 20 kinds of oolong tea. And how many kinds of different kinds of tea are there? There's probably 10 or 15 different main varieties of tea. So just there alone, I've got maybe, I don't know, 150, 300 kinds of tea. And that's just different kinds of tea. So I could just have different kinds of stuff. Their physical characteristics. What's their flavor? Oftentimes we differentiate commodities on where they are. So oolong tea here versus oolong tea there might be two very different commodities. So if I'm really getting international trade right, then I might want to think about where countries are distributing their resources across the globe or within their own country. So a good in one in place and versus a good in another place, those are two very different goods a lot of the time. So we've all had a friend that says something like, hey, I have something for you, but it's not there. I need you to go get it. But if you go get it, it's yours. Think about Godfather 2 and the rug scene. Right? Somebody says, oh, I got a gift for you, which in this case is something to be stolen. I got a gift for you, but we got to go get it. That's because that gift, not in your physical proximity, you care about that far less than that gift if it's in your physical proximity. Your favorite aromatherapy device far from you doesn't matter at all. Your favorite aromatherapy device close to you, oh, that's great. I've got tea, I've got aromatherapy. Do you know how much it takes to prop up my morale enough to talk into this can? Do you know how much hygge I require? I also might care about time. Gold today versus cold gold tomorrow, that's not the same thing. I might care, I might have different preferences tomorrow. Things might be very different tomorrow. So I might care not just about the spatial location of items, I might also care about the temporal location of items. So I can differentiate oolong tea today versus oolong tea tomorrow. Finally, I might differentiate commodities on state of the world. Consider an umbrella. Everybody likes umbrellas. But I don't know about you, but I like umbrellas more when it's raining than when it's not raining. 
If it's not raining, I don't want to walk around with an umbrella. I look, I look like that guy that walks around with an umbrella just in case. Nobody likes that person. I care differently about umbrellas depending on whether it's raining or not raining. The state of the world influences how much I like these commodities. And essentially, an umbrella when it's raining is a fundamentally different good than an umbrella when it's not raining. Iced tea is a fundamentally different good on a hot day than it is on a cold day. So there's all sorts of commodities. You, there's, there's different commodities just in terms of their physical characteristics. There's a million different kinds of tea. But then also I can differentiate these commodities based on their time, based on their location, and based on the state of the world. And if you, if you get all these things right, then you end up with models of international trade, international financial markets where we're trying to mitigate risk about the state of the world. All sorts of different models can happen if you try to get some of these things just right. But in the basic flavor, it's just cloth and wine, two commodities. But you can go in so many different directions with this. But the thing that I want you to get out of this, other than all the different kinds of tea, the thing that I want you to get out of this is what you wind up buying, what you wind up demanding, depends on your preferences, your initial resources, and the prices. And there's a function that reads in prices and reads in your resources and conditional on your preferences that reads in these things and it spits out what you're going to buy. And we call that a demand function. And that's it, right? There's this triangle. You can imagine the triangle fluctuating. I got sliders everywhere. I can make the triangle fluctuate by talking about your resources. I can make the triangle fluctuate talking about the prices. And I could change how the triangle interfaces with your preferences if I, if I move your utility function. But that's it. That's it. So you've got a utility function and you had some resources to start and you saw the prices and you combine these things to, three things together and you buy something. Isn't that cool? All from a fable, all from a story, all from a story about how to take some information and turn it into some other information through a plausible economic story. So now that you've seen the consumer's problem and the punchline of the demand function, which depends on the prices and depends on the resources and depends a little bit implicitly on the preferences, now it's time for us to think about what this looks like when multiple states interact in this sort of environment. We'll talk about that over in the B block. So here in the B block, it's just a matter of taking what we just talked about and putting it in the Edgeworth box. Again, I want to do this mostly by way of example. So suppose that we have two countries, call them England and Portugal. I'm not trying to be Eurocentric here. Uh, so cloth, wine, England, Portugal, this is all from the example given by David Ricardo when he was first talking about comparative advantage. Um, so this is sort of the beginning of a lot of international trade theory, which goes back to David Ricardo's work on comparative advantages. And the example that he worked through was cloth and wine with England and Portugal. Suppose that England enters into the interaction with the following endowment, seven bolts of cloth and one barrel of wine. I've never had English wine and I don't want to. I'm assuming there's not a whole, I don't think there's a vibrant wine industry going on over in, over in England. So seven one, the initial endowment for England is seven bolts of cloth, one barrel of wine. And suppose that Portugal had three bolts of cloth and four barrels of wine. I'm assuming it's port wine. So, so seven, seven for England and one for England, and then three for Portugal and four for Portugal. Well, let me ask you a, a quick question to see how you're thinking so far. Which of them is wealthier? Which of them is richer? England has seven, seven cloths and one wine, and Portugal has four, has three cloths and four wines. Which is richer? You can pause the video if you need to. It was a trick question. It depends on the prices. If cloth is very expensive, then England is richer. And if wine is very expensive, then Portugal is richer. It's gonna depend. So that's an initial endowment for two states. I can put that into an Edgeworth box. So let's get back to that Edgeworth box. So remember, an Edgeworth box is just a rectangle that is however many bolts of cloth wide that we have, the total amount of bolts of cloth wide, and the total amount of barrels of wine tall. And you'll notice that I've very cleverly chosen these numbers. Maybe clever is a strong word. So that there are in fact, 10 total bolts of cloth, seven for England and three for Portugal, and five total barrels of wine, uh, one for England and four for Portugal. Where's the endowment in this box? Well, remember that we start, this is England's origin. 
And this is Portugal's origin. So the idea here is that England's cloth goes this way and Portugal's cloth goes this way. And England's wine goes this way and Portugal's wine goes this way. Okay. So the idea here is I need to go seven. I need to go seven units to the east. And I need to go one unit up. And that's the endowment for England. Okay. Now notice something with me though. I could do the same with Portugal. Notice that if I went, if I took Portugal three over and four down, I'm at the same exact dot. So I this where the endowment lives and this it, it perfectly captures both the England part and the Portugal part. So that that's our initial endowment. And we're just gonna keep that fixed now. That's that's gonna be that's gonna that's gonna be held fixed. So from now on, the initial endowment is seven one three four, which is this one dot in this Edgeworth box. And let's just suppose for now the price is 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 one dollar per bolt of cloth and one dollar per barrel of wine. So let's suppose that both prices are one. And let's draw which bundles the two states can afford. If they sold their if they sold their endowments, suppose the states both sell their endowments. They observe that they have this initial endowment. They observe the prices of one and one, and they sell their stuff. They sell their stuff. So England sells her seven bolts of cloth and gets $7, and her one barrel of wine and gets $1 and winds up with $8. Portugal, on the other hand, sells her three bolts of cloth and gets $3, and her four barrels of wine and gets $4 and winds up with $7. So what does that do? Well, let's, let's, let's just draw the consumer's problem from England's perspective in here, and then we'll see if it works for Portugal too. So if I draw all of the affordable bundles for England, that don't require creating any new cloth or any new wine. So let's just, there, there's 10 cloth and there's five wine and that's it. So if England spent all $8 on cloth, then she would wind up at eight zero, which is right here. It's one to the east of where she was before. So she'd wind up at eight zero. And if she spent all $8 on wine, she'd end up sort of too, too far high in the box. And so I'm just gonna draw the line as it would be, but it's gonna get cut off by the top of the box because there's only five barrels of wine total in this example. So I wind up with this with this line. There's eight zero, which is pretty intuitive. And then there's a line that would have gone all the way up to zero eight, but I got cut off because there's only five barrels of wine. So in other words, England, the, the whiniest bundle that England could purchase is three bolts of cloth and five all five barrels of wine. So she could go anywhere between eight zero, the seven one that she started off with, all the way up to, to three five. So this is England's affordability frontier right now. England's budget set is everything southwest of this frontier, right? And again, if I change the prices, all I would do is change this angle. Now consider Portugal. Let's see if this all lines up if we think about this from Portugal's standpoint. So Portugal right now is worth $7. If she spent all $7 on cloth, she would end up at 7-0 from her perspective. 7-0 from her perspective is all the way right back at that dot three five that we had before from England. So that ends up being the same exact corner. That ends up being the same exact spot for if, if Portugal spends all of her money on cloth, that takes us to the same exact part of the box as where England was spending the maximum amount on wine. Conversely, if Portugal spent all $7 on wine, well, there's only, she could only buy up to five bottles. So then she'd not wind up with two barrels of two bolts of cloth as well. Next thing you know, we're down at the same exact point that was eight zero from England's perspective is 5-2 from Portugal's perspective. And so you'll see that this line, this frontier line, this affordability line, sorry, I'm going the exact wrong way. So this affordability line, this affordability line works for both states. So I can take the initial endowment and put a line right through it, depending on the prices. And that works just as well for England or for Portugal. That price determines the line. It turns out that the slope of this affordability line is just that it's, it's perpendicular to the prices, right? So it ends up being the negative ratio of the prices. So here it's, this slope has a, has a, this line has a slope of minus one because the price of cloth is one. The price of wine is one. It's going to wind up being minus P cloth over P wine throughout. So whenever I change the prices, I wind up changing this angle, keeping it in the endowment. If I change the prices a little bit, all I would do is change this. So let's suppose that I turned the, let's say I turned the price of cloth up to two. Let's say the cloth became more expensive. Well, if cloth becomes more expensive, then England can afford more because England is richer in cloth. 
Similarly, if wine becomes more expensive, then Portugal becomes richer because they are richer in, and you can imagine sort of things starting to favor Portugal more, right? So, so in this two by two example, in this Edgeworth box, you can just use your intuitions about which country gets richer as the prices begin to favor their respective commodity. You can just sort of change these budget sets, these things that they could afford, and by changing by changing the prices, right? So these the prices determine which side is the England side and which side is the Portugal side in terms of these budget sets. Okay. So this is really just that consumer's problem example from the A block. It's just that it happened once for England and it happened once for Portugal. You really do just take it once, flip it, but this is just two versions of the A block, one from here and one from here, where the prices sort of tell you which problem is which problem. That's pretty cool, right? I wish I had more hands. So you can interpret any bundle along this line, any bundle along this line is a potential trade at the prevailing market prices. We can go from the endowment anywhere else so for example, consider the bundle 5-3, where, where England has five bolts of cloth and three barrels of wine, and where Portugal has five bolts of cloth and two bottles of wine. We can just move this we can just move along the line to some other bundle. Now what happened to get there? What did we have to do to get there? To get there, England gave up two bolts of cloth. She went from seven bolts of cloth to five bolts of cloth, and Portugal got those two. She went from three to five. Right, so we just exchanged two, two bolts of cloth. England got poorer by two bolts of cloth and Portugal got richer by two bolts of, cl of cloth. And because the prevailing market prices are the same for the two things, you can figure out for yourself and you can also observe in the context of the box that England got richer by two barrels of wine and Portugal got poorer by two barrels of wine. They just traded cloth for wine one to one because they had the same price. So in other words, trade is something that happens along this line. Trade takes us from the initial endowment to somewhere else on this line of affordability for the two states, given the prices. The prices tell us which trades are available to us. That's pretty cool. International trade is just living along this line. International, who exports and who imports is just, where does the endowment compare to some other bundle on this line? Whatever the final part of trade is, whatever the outcome of trade is, you can just think about it as somewhere else in this box and you can figure out who imported and who exported. Now, we haven't really talked about what the outcome is going to be just yet. So I just want to I want to re-remind you about what Pareto optimality looks like in this box. So let's take our initial endowment, which you'll remember is seven cloth and one wine for England and three cloth and four wine for Portugal. Let's draw in some level sets. Let's draw England's level set through the endowment, which goes shoo. And let's draw Portugal's level set through the endowment, which goes shoo. We wind up with this lens most of the time. So there's all these opportunities for win-win. There are all sorts of bundles that the two states prefer to the initial endowment. So it seems as if this is an opportunity for a win-win. There's all sorts of different bundles. There's different allocations of resources that the two states prefer to the initial endowment. So generally speaking, the initial endowment is highly unlikely to be um, Pareto efficient, Pareto optimal. And because of that, it's very the first sort of graphical thing I want to talk about here is just this lens of win-win that emerges all sorts of different allocations that both states prefer. However, both states preferring it is going to be insufficient because we're also going to require that both states feel as if what they purchased was optimal given the prices, which is to say we're going to talk about demand functions. Let me show you what the end goal of our quest is. We want to find some bundle that is affordable for both states and therefore living along the line, sort of the price line. We want to find a bundle that along the price line where England would have bought that bundle given her wealth and given the prices and Portugal would have bought that bundle given her wealth and given the prices. We need it to be the case that both states, given the prices, demand 
the amount that lives in the Edgeworth box. So suppose the prices were 1, 1. And so we were just going through it, just like in our introductory example. An interesting question is, at 1, 1, given that price, given the price, $1 for, for cloth and $1 for wine, and given the subsequent triangle that we get, the truncated triangle that we get for England, which bundle would they demand? And which bundle would Portugal demand? And are they the same bundle in the Edgeworth box? In other words, I want to try to find a place where the total demand, conditional on prices, is equal to the total supply. Does there exist a price line? Does there exist an angle of this line that goes through this dot? Does there exist an angle of the line that goes through the dot such that what England would buy at that line and what Portugal would buy at that line end up being the same dot? That's a lot of things coming together. Now it's England's preferences, Portugal's preferences, England's endowment of two commodities, Portugal's endowment of two commodities, and the prices of those two commodities. We're trying to figure out how this all goes together in a way that makes markets equilibrate, that makes supply equal to demand. And the answer is it depends on the prices, right? If the prices lean in one direction, it might be far too difficult. We wind up with too many distortions. Somebody's gonna wanna buy a different bundle given their new wealth level. If I change the prices, I change the wealth levels, and I change the demanded bundles. There are no guarantees at any given price that we're going to wind up able to make supply equal to demand. The, the price is going to have to fluctuate to make sure that happens. That's what a market mechanism does in the neoclassical model. The prices are constantly adjusting. Watch the NBC. Go to a commodities market and what you see are prices fluctuating. You see prices fluctuating. Why do they fluctuate? Why are diamonds more expensive? Than, than water. Why is Bitcoin more expensive than gold? Why? Why are the prices fluctuating? Well, the answer is it depends on how much stuff there is, how much people want it, and who has what to begin with. So over in the C block, I'm gonna complete this part of the fable, show you what the punchline of the fable is, and show you what some of the immediate normative ramifications of that punchline are. So I'm really looking forward to showing that to you. See you there. So here in the C block, I want to talk about Valrasian equilibrium, which is just which prices make it all come together. So we've set up a lot. We've set up an initial endowment. We've set up preferences for the two states. We've set up how the states demand things. We've said, okay, a state comes in with an initial endowment and they have their preferences. And then they observe the prices and they sell all their stuff at the prices. And then they buy back their favorite bundle at those same prices, right? And we found out in the Edgeworth box that we can visualize the influence of prices on both states at the same time. And we can see that the states might not demand bundles that set supply equal to demand. The prices might not be commensurate for what we call market clearing. And so an interesting question is, does there exist a set of prices? Does there exist a set of prices such that what England demands at those set of prices and what Portugal demands at that set of prices winds up being something that gets rid of all the commodities. Can we, can we distribute all of the resources in a way that respects the utility maximization problem of the consumer's problem back from the A block? Can I come up with a set of prices such that when I set that pri those prices, what England buys and what Portugal buys adds up to 10.5? Can I make what England buys plus what Portugal buys in terms of cloth be 10 because there's 10 total to start with? And can I make what Portugal buys and England buys in terms of wine equal five because there were five barrels of wine to begin with? Can I make sure that all of the resources get distributed in a way that respects this underlying, I wanna buy my favorite bundle behavior for the two states? So in terms of a definition, let's just say that for the purposes of today's lecture, a Valrasian equilibrium is a set of prices, P, P cloth and P wine such that the amount of cloth that England demands at that price and the set of cloth that Portugal demands at that price is equal to 10. 
and the amount of cl- wine that England demands and the amount of wine that Portugal demands at that price is equal to five. Can we set demand equal to supply? In the Edgeworth box, what that would look like is some some slope of the line that goes through 7-1. So here's 7-1, and I've got to find some slope of the line such that what England demands and what Portugal demands wind up converging to be the same dot. Can I make these two demand curves come together and intersect in a beautiful little equilibrium? That's a Valrasian equilibrium, a market equilibrium. This is what competition looks like. This is what exchange looks like. This is the economic mode of transfer. This is the pricing mechanism. Prices fluctuate to set supply equal to demand. And an important punchline is there always exists at least one Valrasian equilibrium under the assumptions that we've been talking about up to this point. There always exists, a, there's always a set of prices that clears markets. There always exists a set of prices such that what people want to buy is equal to how much stuff there is. So in other words, exchange can work. That's all that we've established so far is that this doesn't just fall itself, this doesn't just fall into chaos. This doesn't just collapse. There exists a set of prices that make the market work. That was a big deal. That was, um, so, so, so proving that that existed won some Nobel prizes. And the initial proof of, the initial proof that a Valrasian equilibrium existed was explicitly in the model of international trade. International trade has been one of the most important areas for developing this, this generally more important class of market models. International trade is a great place for us to start thinking about trade but it's not the place where you have to end thinking about trade. This model works for domestic markets and for all sorts of other markets too. Actually, the there were two competing sets of scholars that were trying to prove that this pricing equilibrium existed. And uh, there was a little bit of a race to figure out who would get that published first because it was a huge open problem. Actually, there's a little bit of somewhat nefarious behavior on, on the behavior of, uh, on the side of one set of scholars. And so when it, they, they submitted the papers with the proof twice, you know, the, separately at almost the same time. And then the editor of the journal had to figure out who deserved to go first and who deserved to go second. All sorts of weird things that happen in the academy. There are full books written on the race to prove what I just showed you. Like thick books. Not on the equilibrium itself, but on the history of what it took to prove it. And all the sort of nasty behavior between the professors that were trying to figure that out. So we know that a Valrasian equilibrium exists. Let's talk about what it looks like. So let's begin from our initial endowment. And think, I can have prices that I can go like, so I can go super duper duper steep, steep, in which case wine is very expensive compared to cloth, or I can go super duper duper shallow, in which case cloth is very expensive relative to wine, and anywhere in between. And think about it. So at any one of these lines, there's what England would buy and what Portugal would buy, and they might not be the same place. And what winds up happening is somewhere as I fluctuate, somewhere as I, the god of this world, fluctuate these prices, There's at least one price that I could choose, at least one relative price of cloth and wine. There's at least one such that the two dots coincide. And when the two dots coincide, the market has cleared. And this price is the equilibrium price. Notice that the dot, the dot that we're talking about here, the dot that we're talking about, the dot that they both buy, That's in the win-win lens. This dot is generally strictly preferred by both states to the initial endowment. So we wind up with, we learn the price and then we can see how much exporting and importing is required to get from our initial endowment to the new final distribution of resources where the prices have fluctuated to tell us where we're gonna wind up. Therefore, the prices have fluctuated to tell us who is wealthy and who is not and whose commodities are good commodities, wealth-inducing, and whose are not. Who is wealthy depends. It is endogenous. Wealth is inside the system, not outside the system. Wealth emerges in response to other factors. If I walked up to you and said, I'm very wealthy because I have all this water, you'd be like, well, that's great that you have water and you'll never go thirsty. That's pretty cool, but it's not worth anything. Why isn't it worth anything? Because the price of water is low. Why is the price of water low? Because market's cleared. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a second, but what I'm trying to say to you is wealth is inside the system. Provocatively, so too is power. 
Wealth is the is the residue of exchange, and power is the residue of conflict, and they both emerge in response to other factors depending on which mechanism of transfer we're operating under. Who is wealthy depends. Who is powerful depends. Okay. So I want to finish up by talking about the two welfare theorems of neoclassical economics. So I want to talk about the, the welfare ramifications, the normative ramifications of this trading outcome. Right? We just we just went from one dot in the box to another dot in the box, and in so doing, we set a market price. And the market price emerged to set supply equal to demand. We have no idea about any of the natural properties of this outcome just yet. All that we said is there's an outcome. And we know that the outcome is a win-win. That's all that we know. Let me tell you something cool. The outcome is Pareto optimal. Now let's think about what the set of all Pareto optimal outcomes look like in the Edgeworth box. Remember, Chewy says hi, by the way. The outcome started at the dot where Portugal had everything and England had nothing. And it ended at the dot where England had everything and Portugal had nothing. And we wind up with just this line of Pareto optimal outcomes through the, through the Edgeworth box. And what I'm saying to you is, the final outcome for trade is somewhere along that wiggly line. Why is that so? I'm not going to prove this, but let's just think about it. Let's think about the consumer's problem, where we talked about how your how your level set has to just kiss, has to just kiss your affordability line, your budget set. It has to just kiss it. Well, what does that look like here in the two-dimensional version? Well, for England, here's the price line. Their level set just kisses it. Otherwise, that wouldn't be what they demanded. They only demand bundles that just kiss where the prices coincide with the level sets in this kissy way. It's not a sentence I was planning on saying today. And likewise for Portugal, their level set just kisses. And so we wind up with these <laughs> level sets that just kiss, which is exactly what we talked about last week about Pareto optimality. So trade takes us to a Pareto optimal outcome. That's the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics. The first fundamental theorem of, of welfare economics states that the outcome of any Valrasian equilibrium is Pareto optimal. This is viewed as the crystallization of Adam Smith's logic about it's not the benevolence of the butcher or the baker that lead to good outcomes, but rather self-interest that aggregates through this invisible hand of market equilibration away. This fable, this mathematical fable, ends up confirming to a certain degree, or, or at least aligning with Adam Smith's original arguments in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations is endogenous to market processes. The Wealth is endogenous. The Wealth is inside the system. Where does the Wealth of Nations come from? It comes from Edgeworth boxes between countries. So the idea is that Decentralized market processes yield outcomes that are at least Pareto optimal, right? You couldn't make anybody better off without making somebody strictly worse off. Now notice that this line was, was very small. In the context of this rectangle, the set of Pareto optimal outcomes is very small. If I said just pick a dot at random, just pick a dot at random somewhere out of this line, out of this box, just pick some dot out of this rectangle at random, the probability that you found a dot that was exactly on this line is zero. There's an infinite number of these things, but they're very rare. They're very rare in the context of this overall thing. It's sort of like a sheet of paper in space, except it's a line in a rectangle. An interesting question is, what is, how is our three-dimensional space small in the set of four-dimensional space? Oh. So it's pretty interesting. It's interesting that trade happens to do something, happens to find something that occurs with probability zero. Free trade in this neoclassical model, trade finds an outcome that's pretty rare. It finds an outcome that's Pareto optimal, which is a minimal normative criterion, but still an important normative criterion. And it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare to get that normative criterion achieved in this rectangle, and yet trade does it. However, as we discussed before, Pareto optimality is a minimal normative concern. And so you might not like some of the Pareto optimal outcomes. If you're more egalitarian, you might not like the parts of the line that are down here. 
and you might not like the parts of the line that are up here. You might want to find some intermediate Pareto optimal outcome. Maybe there's some distribution of happiness that you like, and conditional on that distribution of happiness, you would like to try to find an optimal outcome that is egalitarian. So let's say that you had some target Pareto optimal outcome in your mind. Let's say it was this right in the middle. Boom. And the interesting question is, does there exist an endowment for which this desired efficient outcome is the free trade equilibrium, is the Volrasian equilibrium? That's an interesting question. It's an interesting question. So now, suppose you had a target. You have a target in mind. You're an international institution. And you're like, you know what? We're going to try to find optimal outcomes, but we also want to try to improve the distribution of resources across the globe. We want to reduce poverty or something. We want to reduce poverty, and so we need to make sure that all states have some amount of resources to, to get them over the poverty line or some such. The so Millennium Development Goals. We want to make sure that every country has enough stuff. But we don't want to give up the optimality. So here's a target Pareto optimal outcome that, that achieves some balance of resources that is desirable per our international institution. Can I get that to be the free trade outcome? That's a tough question, which is to say, can I take the, right now, this desired outcome is not a Valrasian equilibrium for our initial endowment. Our initial endowment won't get us to where you're asking us to go. Congratulations on being an international institution. So right as of right now, the desired outcome is not the actual outcome. The actual Valrasian equilibrium for our actual endowment right now is not egalitarian enough for your needs. So the question is, can I just move the endowment? Is there a way for me to move the endowment? Can I make transfers? Can I write checks? Can I be, can I be Robin Hood? Can I take from the rich one and give to the poor one in a way that after market after we've made that transfer, then markets happen and then free then we wind up with the desired outcome? Can we take the endowment? do some Robin Hood, lump sum transfers, wind up at a new modified endowment, same amount of stuff before, every th I'm just gonna give some of my stuff to you or you're gonna give some of your stuff to me. Can we, can, we, can we modify the endowment through lump sum transfers? Right now, all I have to do, if I'm England, all I have to do is give a little bit to Portugal. I don't need a third party. All, we have, to, all I have to do is get, write you a check. Can I write you a check? Wind up at a new endowment. And then after we trade, prices equilibrate supply and demand in a way that generates the desired outcome? And the answer is yes. So under the assumptions that we've been talking about, for any Pareto optimal allocation of resources, there exists a set of lump sum transfers from the endowment such that after the lump sum transfer, the new Valrasian equilibrium is the desired outcome. That's the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics. It tells you that for any desired optimal outcome, there's a way to get there that involves lump sum transfers and then market transfers. So the basic idea is if we want to improve development or something, per this fable, we want to improve development per this fable, all I have to do is figure out some set of checks for the, for the rich countries to write to the poor countries. And then just let them trade like before. Just get hands off. So it's it's like minimal hands off. It's still hands off because we're still just trading in a market. The prices are allowed to, to, to flow freely. There's no rent control. There's no price control, etc. Just let the prices flow. However, I have to modify the initial endowment. And if I modify the endowment with just writing checks in this fable, I wind up generating any Pareto optimal outcome that you ask me to. Egalitarian, not egalitarian. Punishes the bad states, rewards the good states, whatever you want. Any Pareto optimal outcome is a potential equilibrium. So not only does trade magically solve the zero probability problem of getting me from something not optimal to something optimal, the first fundamental theorem. It is also true that something like the converse, something like the other direction of that theorem is also true. For any Pareto optimal outcome, which are rare, but if you give me any one of them, if you give me a target, I can get you there in two steps, lump sum transfers and then free trade. So those are the neoclassical arguments for international, in international trade. 
equilibrium exists, which is to say the market can work. Trade is, is efficient, which is to say the first fundamental theorem. And you can, I can get anywhere I want to with by writing checks and then letting markets happen. Don't influence the prices. Let the prices send their signals. That's the idea with this point. This fable is sort of all about letting the prices do their thing. You might need to modify the endowments. You might need to give from the rich to the poor. But then just let the poor buy what they want to buy with whatever, whatever the prevailing market prices would be. It's really interesting, right? Now, there's a lot of assumptions made along the way. Right? And you can imagine that relaxing any one of those assumptions kind of spoils some of these results, but it's interesting that one can write down an intuitive starting point fable that generates outcomes like these. I think that's fascinating, personally. So this is international trade in the Edgeworth box. Prices emerge, and in so doing, tell you who is wealthy and who is not. Prices emerge in response to the market. They set supply equal to demand. Generally speaking, a price will be higher for a good that is more liked by countries with lots of market power. If the good is relatively scarce, its price will be relatively high. So the prices wind up combining all of this different information into, into two numbers. The price of cloth and the price of, price of wine. It takes the endowments. It takes the preferences. It, it, takes, it takes all this stuff and it spits out the prices. And in so doing, it tells you who's wealthy and who gets what. And along the way, it generates a Pareto optimal outcome. All of that from something that I could almost meaningly, meaningfully convey to you in an hour with two triangles and a rectangle. So this is, this is one of the most important fables in the social sciences. This is the introductory fable for those interested in the mechanism of exchange. And now you have some rough sense about what the, what the introductory rudiments of that particular fable are. Prices, endowments, preferences. Combine those things and you have a pretty powerful way to think about international trade. So what do we talk about today? Well, we talked about exchange. We talked about sort of the canonical model of exchange, which is a market model. In that model, there are Two competing actors with two, in, two commodities that they're interested in, in, in trying to get more of. They want more stuff, but they are constrained by how many resources they have and by what the value of those resources is. And we learned that despite the complexity of international trade, despite the fact that there's all sorts of commodities and all sorts of states, and all of these things are happening, all sorts of tiny little things, there's no way that I could tell you how much the average consumer in India, cares about, cares about whiteboard markers. However, the price of whiteboard markers is in some infinitesimal sense dependent on what representative consumers in countries all across the globe feel about things as mundane as whiteboard markers, or microphones, or oolong tea, or lighting, or iPads. These prices end up combining, amalgamating massive amounts of information. Amounts of information that there's no way that any one state or any one consumer would be able to keep track of it all. But you don't have to. When you walk into the mini mart and the Diet Coke says a dollar, that dollar encapsulates all sorts of different things. And if, and if you didn't want to buy the good at a dollar and if enough of us didn't want to buy Diet Coke at a dollar, the price of Diet Coke would go down. The price of the Diet Coke isn't just there for no reason. It's there to help to equilibrate markets. It's there to help clear markets. And in so doing, it has to combine who has what, who cares about what, and how much stuff is there. And what we learned was, despite all this complication, the market can work. Valrasian equilibrium exists. We also learned that in the canonical version of the fable, in the introductory version of the fable, without any of the little annoyances that emerge, uh, we learned that the market distributes resources efficiently, but that's a minimal normative criterion. And then if you're willing to impose lump sum transfers, then we're able to achieve any Pareto optimal outcome through lump sum transfer and then free trade. And I promised you before that the, that the mechanism of transfer that we call exchange is the efficient. It is the win-win. And so those welfare theorems really are the delivery on my promise from last week. However, nobody ever said that after you buy things at the marketplace that somebody can't hit you after 
and take what you just bought. It was with the notion of hitting just after in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. So there's conflict and there's exchange. We talked about exchange ad nauseum today. We'll be talking about conflict throughout a lot of the rest of the class. You know, the thing that made me want to go to grad school, I, I went to I went to undergrad in the in the 2000s, and so um, the, the Iraq conflict was fresh on lots of people's mind. You know, a, a common refrain at the time was that it was a war for oil. There was The idea was that the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, um, a, a big, if not the single uh, motivating force in that was an attempt to, to get oil on the cheap. How do we get more oil? We do so by invading and taking taking that endowment away. It's like, oh, hey, Iraq, you had some endowment of oil. That's ours now. And it occurred to me that that, that was kind of interesting. And it was interesting for all sorts of reasons. But, you know, the, the war for oil refrain, it was so common that it got me thinking. And I was like, to take oil, to build an army big enough to take oil, you have to build an army. And armies use a lot of oil. So in other words, in order for me to take oil off of you, if that's the idea, in order for me to take oil off of you, I have to burn oil myself. Now I've bought more oil. I've driven the price of oil up by buying so much oil. Right? I've, I've made the demand for oil go up. I've, I've made the supply of oil go down. There's, there's less oil in the world because of how much oil is in my tanks. So now I've got a tank. And I'm going to take your oil with it. I'm going to take your oil fields with it. And along the way, the oil fields that I'm trying to steal off of you are getting destroyed. Right? They're, they're, we're burning the oil fields as, as, as the fighting is happening. This is a pretty common tactic when somebody's trying to take resources. Is, oh, just burn the resources that somebody's trying to steal. Then they'll stop trying to steal. So in order for me to take oil from you, I have to take oil off the market to put it into my tanks. And then as I'm stealing from you, a lot of the oil is getting wasted. That seems awfully inefficient to me. Why wouldn't I just buy the oil off of you? Well, the answer is because it's too expensive. Well, then I'm thinking to myself, well, what, do the prices depend on how much I'm fighting with you then? Which is to say, doesn't conflict screw up exchange? Yes. So this perfect little pristine exchange model that I showed you today, if we changed cloth and wine, to oil and anything else. If we changed England and Portugal to the United States and Iraq, then this war for oil story becomes very difficult to think through because I'm having to take oil off the market to, to, to make me strong enough to take oil off of you. I should have just traded for it. Why was the price of oil so artificially high? And the answer is because the price of oil is something that is does not emerge competitively. All this to say, pristine models of exchange get thrown off by the fact that when we fight, there's a political economic underbelly to fighting. When I build an army, I do so with an economy in mind and not just the military in mind. I don't just want to build any force, I want to build the best force that I can conditional on my constraints. That's an economic problem. And then once I have the army, I gotta figure out where to send it. That's also an economic problem. And I have to do all of this thinking about the thing that I'm foregoing by not just buying the thing that I'm trying to take. That's also an economic problem. So in other words, conflict is economics and economics is conflict. Just the disentangling that I tried to talk about at the end of last lecture and that we, we work so hard to keep fighting out of today's Edgeworth boxes, that's naive probably. And the same works in reverse. Why would I want to fight you to take something if it was so cheap that I could just buy it and not even care? If I don't care about building, if I don't want to build an army, then I won't build an army. I'll just buy stuff off of it. So in other words, the things that motivate me to fight depend on exchange. And the act of fighting depends on exchange. So conflict informs exchange and exchange informs conflict. For all of the disentangling, they are the solutions to the same underlying problem of I want more stuff and I gotta figure out the best way to get it. And it might involve selling all my stuff and then buying back at market prices. Or it might involve investing some of my stuff into an army and then stealing with it, even though that's highly inefficient. And so we see that once it winds up happening is this combination of the two sets of physics, where on the one hand, I'm doing something competitive, I'm responding to prices, I'm making my decisions about how, what kind of army to build and what kind of bundles to buy, I'm doing all of that informed by the market mechanism, because if things were cheap, I wouldn't fight. It takes a certain amount of expense to make me interested in wanting to invest in an army. But once I'm doing that, 
then I'm influencing the pricing mechanism because I'm taking stuff off the market and I'm stealing stuff instead of buying it. Suddenly, the things that influence prices are a lot less important to me. But I don't do this all the way. I'm always a little bit trading and I'm always a little bit fighting. I'm always a little bit conflict and I'm always a little bit exchange. I'm always a little bit politics and I'm always a little bit economics. I'm always everything all the time. Which is to say, if we view international relations as a strategic puzzle, we have to take both modes of transfer into account. It is insufficient to study war without thinking about markets. It is insufficient to study markets without thinking about war. IPE and conflict are the same thing. Now, I didn't know any of this, and I still don't. But this, this was all just on my mind because of this puzzle of why would you fight a war for oil? Why wouldn't you just buy the oil? Oh, it's too expensive. Well, why is it so expensive? Why wouldn't they lower the price so the people wouldn't want to fight them? There's, all, there's this giant chicken and egg problem at work, not in terms of which variables influence which other variables, but in terms of which processes involve which other processes. An interesting question then is what is the unifying thing, right? And actually, one cool way to think about it is, is based on Star Wars. So, so one of my great academic heroes was an economist named Jack Herschleifer, who spent the first three quarters of his career studying market models like what we talked about today and where prices come from, classic economic theory. And then at the end decided, hey, none of this involves fighting and fighting is as economics too. And so he wrote a, a series of articles which wound up, wound up being part of a compendium called The Dark Side of the Force. Right? So there's a good side of the force and a bad side of the force in the sense that one is efficient and one is inefficient. One is win-win and one is zero-sum, but they're the same force. And the force is competition. The force is getting more stuff. The force is making your way to maximize your utility in some way, given all of the available strategic availabilities, given all of your procedural possibilities, given all of your opportunities to buy and all of your opportunities to fight. It's all just one force. This is something that I'm very passionate about because it seems to me that people always want to look at one slice of the force. They always want to look at one little piece of the force. They want to study Edgeworth boxes or they want to study game th the bargaining model of war, but they never want to study both at the same time. What the pie is worth is endogenous. What the fighting is worth is endogenous. What the spoils of war are worth is endogenous. These things all are inside of the system, and what's outside is what the states want, what the states have, and where the states are headed. When you zoom out and look at the entire globe from a sufficiently high vantage point, you can't help but notice that all of the trillions of interactions that are going on in any moment in time are unified by a single force. And it's hard to see that force. It's hard to see that force without taking certain slices of it. The force is so big that if you don't want to go all the way up to the moon to look down on the globe, if you don't want to have to work that hard, if you don't want to have to go that high, if you don't want to have to get a bird's eye view so you can see everything happening at once in one harmonious way, if you don't want to go that high, then you have no choice but to try to look at the, a slice of the force. If you don't go up high enough, you can only see little pieces of the force, and then we piece those pieces together. And that has basically been how a lot of international relations study has proceeded. But the market mechanism that I showed you today where the prices that emerge depend both on how resources are distributed and which resources are scarce and who, which states want which resources. What we learned from all of that is that the prices that emerge in the subsequent distribution are so much more than just the sum of the parts. And so all of the slivers of the force that we see, the economic slivers or the fighting slivers or the organizational slivers, all these little slivers of the force that we see, Trying to piece the force together from those slivers alone is insufficient because the whole of the force is more than the sum of the slivers. Now, none of this is to say that we shouldn't zoom in. None of this is to say that we shouldn't take slivers. We should. And whenever you read a piece of history or a scholarly paper or something, try to see it on its own terms. Look at it and understand it intrinsically. Look at it full, zoomed in, close up. But understand also that whatever lessons you learn from that must be contextualized in the context of a much larger force, a much larger system, where the whole is much more than some of those parts. In a sense, the model that I showed you today is an archetype.
it is an exemplar of a social scientific model in that it allows the whole to be more than the sum of the parts. It allows the prices to be more than just what individual states want or the scarcity of resources or whatever. It allows for systemic response to state level behavior. But even it falls short because it doesn't acknowledge the conflictual aspects of the force. The world is so big that we have no choice but to take slivers of it. But we also have to be humble about what we're going to do with those slivers once we have them. Thanks for watching.